Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar, which is Breaking Business Barriers Accelerate Your Business with VR. This is part of one of the University of Essex's University Enterprise Zone events. Um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome uh, Bertie and Sammy onto the, the call this morning. Hopefully, uh, you should be able to see the presentation uh, and you should also uh, be able to see myself in one of the video boxes. So what we have today is about a 40 minute presentation followed by a 20 minute uh, Q&A opportunity. Um, throughout the course of the presentation, if you have a question you'd like us to ask to Bertie or Sammy at the end, um, if you're using a laptop or a PC at the bottom of your screen, if you move your mouse, you'll see a Q&A function. If you pop a question into there for us, uh, I'm joined by John and Egler, who are going to be managing those questions. And what we'll do is we'll collate all of those and we'll ask them to the presenters at the end. Um, virtual, um, uh, uh, excuse me, virtual umbrella um, are a, a business designed at helping uh, companies tap into the commercial and creative potential of immersive technology. And they've worked with the likes of Uber and Gucci. Um, so I think they're incredibly well placed to be talking about the opportunities that businesses can unlock with uh, new technologies. Um, so I'm delighted to, to hand over to uh, Bertie and Sammy, um, who will also be ho hosting one-to-ones uh, later on. And if you are interested in a one-to-one -one with them, if you can either put a comment into the chat box or if you email uez at essex.ac.uk, uh, my colleagues Egler or John uh, will respond and they will confirm a time with you to, to have a one-to-one -one with, um, with Samuel Bertie. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over and say thank you very much for joining us this morning. Uh, over to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear us okay and you can see us all right. Um, yes, so thank you so much, Andy, for the introduction. So my name is Sammy. This is my co-founder, Bertie. Um, <laughs> we are the co-founders of Virtual Umbrella. So Andy had a lovely introduction for us there. So uh, just to give you a bit more of a, oh, just double checking, you can hear us. Yeah, perfect. So to give you a little bit more about us. Um, so we've been working in the immersive space for the last uh, five years. So we were founded in 2015. Um, we work with a variety of companies um, who are making VR content, VR solutions. Um, we, it also means that we get to work in a variety of industries, which is quite exciting. So it could be from education to engineering to the arts. We kind of we kind of covered it all um, and we help people with their marketing consultancy and events so um, we've kind of um, any kind of festival that's got VR in it you can think of that's probably where we've been or where people have seen us so just quickly today we're going to talk about the uh, breaking business barriers so we're going to do a bit of a deep dive into some of our kind of favorite case studies um, that are out there at the moment talk a little bit about the challenges of those projects um, think about the solutions and talk a bit about ROI um, uh, just so you know this presentation is going to be available for you afterwards so if if I go over something quite quickly or you miss something or you want to go back you can have this presentation there's links in there as well to reports we talk about um, so that's for you to do whatever you want to with um, also if you want to tweet us at all it's just at virtual umbrella if you don't want to put anything in the chat box today um, so yeah let's crack right into it so um, normally when we do these um, kind of webinars or talks or workshops, we kind of have to kind of cover the basics. Um, so uh, bear with us as we go through this. So what is immersive technology? Um, this lovely little illustration here is one that a lot of people in the VR industry like to use. It's an um, uh, illustration provided by Magic Leap. Um, as you can see there, we've got this lovely little robot at the bottom um, in three different scenarios. So as you can see at the top, we've got the XR, which is kind of the lovely little umbrella term, which is which is a lot of what the kind of VR languages we kind of put under the umbrella. So let's start straight with the VR, so on the left hand side. So as you can see, the little robot is in his a completely different world to the reality of the world that we're in right now. So that's as you put on a headset, you are in a, in a completely new environment. That environment is not what you're currently used to. Um, you can interact with that space as well um, and be able to walk around as well. So that's probably a quite quite straightforward forward term of VR. Um, augmented reality to AR, so going, going next door. Um, you can see the little robot there is kind of in his present home, but he's also a little bit kind of transferred there. So it, also, it means that we're looking at um, 
layering on top of our reality. So think about using an iPhone or an Android phone or an iPad or something to bring something into your world, but not necessarily being, being able to interact with it fully. And then of course onto the end, which is MR, which is mixed. So that's kind of a, a kind of a combination of the two. Um, if you think of HoloLens, etc. Um, and as you can see in that image there, he is kind of in his world and out of his world as well. Does that cover that? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, I think it was Bill Gates. He talked about uh, immersive technologies from, from AR to VR to mixed reality. And he, he talked of it, or he spoke of it like a, like a slider almost like a like a fader that a dj has mm. uh and at one end you've got like the most immersive which is over in virtual reality where you're in a completely different world uh and on the other end you have augmented reality where you're just bringing data and overlaying it on top of the real world and then mixed reality is kind of everything in between where it's uh it's taking virtual elements putting them into your world but making them so they're actually able to mm. interact with the real world as well yeah perfect Oh, and of course, we can't miss out 360, my lovely 360. So this GIF here is one that Bertie likes to use often. Um, it's just a great example of being able to explain the difference between 360 and virtual reality. So as you can see there, you can a 360 video is what you can see in that whole 360, but you can't necessarily move around in that space. Um, a lot of 360 videos as well don't necessarily have any interaction, um, unless it's maybe like a start or a stop button. Um, but that's just quite a nice little GIF we want to put in there. Yeah, when, <laughs> when you get into slightly more in-depth stuff, people talk about three degrees of freedom, mm -hmm. six degrees of freedom and things like this in terms of how much you can move around. Uh, because we're not quite sure of the audience for that, we're kind of going to skip just, that for now. Yeah. But if you want to ask questions about that, that's totally fine. Just stick them in the chat for us. Yeah. Uh, and of course, hardware. So we're going to talk really briefly about hardware and software. So um, I haven't put all the headsets in here. This is just a kind of few which are of probably most popular at the moment or topic wise. I have added the price in here. Just be aware in terms of the price, there is a couple of plus signs on that because there is a difference in obviously if you're buying from America or if the headsets have got um, different kind of um, sizes and stuff. So it does it does go up. So. If we start down on the left hand side, the lovely silver headset is the Oculus Go, which is probably one of the most popular headsets to start with. Um, it's easy to use, um, easy to upload content onto, uh, comes with a controller. And then again, at the starting price is £139. So again, it's probably one of my favourite headsets, I don't know about you. Um, and then moving up, we have the Oculus uh, Quest, which is probably the most talked about um, in the, probably the last eight months. 12 months. Um, again, this is perfect because it's a standalone headset. Um, we don't have any cables that you can charge it, obviously, but you don't have to worry about having a PC, um, which is what we're kind of really um, striving for in the industry at the moment. It's things that are easy, easy to take to a client, easy to put in your bag and take away with you. But um, the Quest is something that we are really, really excited about. And if you've got sort of the higher end um, of VR, you've got something like the HTC. Um, they've got a variety of headsets at the moment, but that's something that you'll most likely recognise with having sensors and larger controllers. Um, but bear in mind that is something where you'll have to have a, um, a VR PC or computer or gaming computer, which will have to have the power to um, use those headsets. Um, so I put 1800 plus on there because I haven't added on the price for, the, for a PC, but just to give you a bit of a better idea. Um, and then going up, we've got um, AR um, headsets. So we've obviously got on the left again, we've got the HoloLens, um, mixed reality from Microsoft, and then just next to it, we do have the Magic Leap. Um, and again, those prices do kind of range. Um, they're a lot more expensive, but they do tend to be more focused around, would you say, the enterprise kind of area that's why their prices are a little bit higher uh, yeah it's a it's a variety of factors uh so ar hardware isn't quite as uh far along as vr hardware so whilst the costs aren't going to come down to the same prices as maybe vr headsets costs will come down over time mm -hmm. but it's also worth thinking about the fact that they're targeted at different markets so the microsoft hololens is very much an enterprise tool mm -hmm. so it has uh, the price that it would it would expect to charge to big businesses. Additionally, it's worth noting that if you're looking at using these headsets uh, inside of your business for like a, a large scale rollout, you're probably gonna have to buy the enterprise versions. So you'll need a specific license, but that comes with things like an extended warranty, fast customer service, and a bunch of other features. But it means that you're actually going to be end up ending up paying paying more 
for the headset. So this is just almost a guide to like the consumer pricing. Yeah. If you're going to buy one headset or two headsets for internal testing and for your first initial work, but when it comes to a much larger rollout, you need to get in touch with the companies directly to get the most up-to-date pricing. And those who are creating content or somebody that you, if you're approach a production company that you want to work with, um, they can really advise you on that. Um, they're the best people to talk about in terms of those price changes. Absolutely. They, they have existing relationships with a lot of the companies as well. So they'll either be aware of the most up-to-date pricing or they'll be able to put you directly in touch with the people that you need to speak to at the companies in order to get that. Yeah. Perfect. That's, uh, so we can't really talk about hardware without software. So um, you're most likely, if you're kind of already interested in the immersive industry, you'll most likely recognize these names. So these are the softwares which are going to help you enable and make the content. Um, Unreal and Unity are obviously most obvious in terms of if you have a gaming background um, and then Microsoft and obviously Spark AR in terms of um, AR. Uh, we've actually been experimenting with Spark AR. It's quite a good um, little setup. I enjoy using it. It's quite straightforward. Um, and most of these engines actually have a lot of support behind them. So um, if this is something you want to do on your own, there is a lot of support um, factors and forums and things that you can um, go to, which is really positive and really nice to know. Yeah, uh, a lot of the documentation is available online yeah. if you're starting to learn this stuff. So it's definitely worth looking into. It's quite easy to get into it. I mean, you still need to put aside like a lot of hours to get used to using the games engines and the technologies. But once you've kind of got the hang of it, you can start developing and making really small stuff quite quickly. Cool. So who is the audience for XR? We kind of have to dive into this a little bit. So um, we're just going to cover a couple of the reports which have um, been released in the last uh, year and a half half I want to say is that correct? about that, yeah. about that. Um, these as again these reports are going to be available in this presentation so we've just taken little chunks out because um, we don't want, we don't want to do it, uh, dive into it too much um, but they're important for you especially if you're a new business looking into this or thinking about a project it's just nice to be able to have that kind of backing of information um, so yeah here we go cool so uh, when we think about the audience for immersive technology it's essential for us to remember that the industry as a whole is still very young uh, it's been around fairly prominently for maybe the last four years or so uh, and in terms of things like computing or other technological advancements out there it's still really new but what this means is that we don't have a uh, massive adoption uh, from big businesses yet and this is something that we hope to see as time progresses uh, there's a company called Perkins Coy. They are a big law firm out in Silicon Valley. They do a lot of the, the legal work and a lot of like the investment paperwork for the, the big investment firms out there. But what this means is that they've had a really unique uh, perspective on the immersive industry because they've almost got skin in the game in that they've helped do all the paperwork for investing into these startups. And as part of it, they're now becoming the lawyers for startups and VR startups now they're really incentivized to see this progress as well because they want to keep their work coming in. But they do a survey every year. They do a VR and AR survey, which is made up of industry workers who work in the space. And 46% of them admitted that a lack of an established market uh, for this technology is still a barrier for them. So despite the fact we've been going for five years or so, half the people who work in this space still see adoption as the biggest barrier. Uh, moving on just to a couple of other statistics from Perkins Coy as well. They're seeing a lot of disruption in uh, healthcare, medical and manufacturing over the next 12 months. So what we've previously seen is VR being used a lot for gaming and for entertainment. It's not necessarily being used a lot for gaming. There's still there's an established gaming market, but I think that gaming has received the most press and people kind of associate VR headsets with playing video games, despite the fact that its applications are actually much, much larger than that. 38% uh, of the respondents said that healthcare and medical devices are ripe sectors for disruption. Additionally, education is another really popular area where we're starting to see headsets being used. And that's across education for teaching in schools and in universities, but also education in terms of workplace training and uh, yeah, upskilling your staff. And the final one, uh, this is actually quite a nice little bit for the return investment part of uh, our remit for this webinar is that Lockheed Martin, they used VR and AR as part of their manufacturing for the Orion spacecraft, and they noted a 90% reduction in their labor costs, which is pretty significant, if, yeah, I, if you ask me. Okay, and then finally, 
I think this is finally. Well, this uh, is finally for this little. Yeah, this little, this little bit. Uh, we have <laughs> uh, the report, the immersive economy in the UK, which was uh, created by Immerse UK and Digital Catapult. So Immerse UK are the largest membership organization in the UK for uh, VR and AR immersive startups. You can probably guess by the name. Mm -hmm. And they do this, uh, they do this report, they, they're trying to do it every year. This is the second year they've been doing it. And in this report, they spoke to industry workers asking what sectors they're working in. So which sectors are their immersive companies working in? And 29% said technology. Uh, I think this is probably a bit of a misnomer because this is probably people saying, oh, I'm a technology company, so I work in technology. But everything else under that is quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Being able to see that 22% of immersive companies are working in the media and the arts sectors, 12% uh, of professional services. So we can see that there really is uh, a broad range of places where uh, startups are finding work and people they're working with. Definitely. I'm now going to move on to a little section about uh, a bit more of an in-depth report that was created by PwC. It's a really popular report. Yeah, this is really popular. Loads yeah. of people have been talking about this because this has got some like nice drill downable numbers. So people have been really looking into this and analysing it. And remember, if again we go over this too quickly or you see something you're like, oh, I want to see that, either take a picture or we'll have it in the, in the presentation afterwards. Yeah, we're going to include links to all the downloadable PDFs. So if you want to look further into this information, you'll be able to after the webinar. So uh, as part of PwC's uh, VR and AR report, they forecasted growth for the next 10 years. And they see VR and AR as potentially uh, boosting global GDP by $1.5 trillion in the next 10 years or so. Uh, you can see on the graph that they're expecting uh, fairly good growth for the next five years or so, and then significant growth for the five years after that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we've got uh, a current impending apocalypse, which yes. may affect this data because this was before that came out. But I mean, I'm, I expect that we'll still see results that are fairly similar to this, but maybe not to the same scale. Uh, we also have a, a model here that shows the comparative contribution of VR and AR. Lots of people like to compare VR and AR saying, oh, one of these technologies is better than the other. But in reality, they're both good for different cases, for different use cases. So it's important for us not to compare VR and AR in terms of rivalry, but compare them in terms of their uses for our desired outcome that we're after. Mm -hmm. I think this is our oh, final wow. one coming up. Uh, this is looking at the areas that are most going to see growth uh, with immersive technologies. So we can see that the USA is still going to be the, the biggest growth area as they have the biggest economy in terms of VR and AR, uh, closely followed by uh, China, uh, the UK, Germany. And there's also some interesting companies on there like Finland and the United Arab Emirates, which mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily foresee as leaders in the immersive space. Uh, but according to PwC's researchers, this is what they're seeing. Cool. Cool. So we kind of have to cover the opportunities within XR right now. So um, what we've done is we've kind of collated um, a variety of sectors which are doing things that we kind of think are really impressive. Um, so there's a lot of deep diving here and a lot of information. Um, but what I would love you to start thinking about, especially if you're kind of exploring this for your own business or a project, is just to start thinking about um, the kind of challenges and those solutions and the ROI that these these particular case studies might start kind of... Um, uh, getting your uh, ideas kind of sparking, which I, which is quite exciting. Um, so, but we are just going to give you one more, um, <laughs> one more uh, little statistics. Again, this is from the uh, immersive economy, but we just really, really liked it, and we thought it was something important to share. Um, so there are some really, really cool percentages on here. Um, so, uh, like, so we got twenty nine percent said that immersive technologies have changed the way their organisation is seen by its peers, um, and I think that's really, really important and key right now. Um, and again, I think some of the examples coming up will will come into those percentages. Um, and also things like, uh, yeah, 92 percent of respondents expect their spend on immersive technologies to grow in the next 12 months. Um, so I think that's incredible in terms of scalability, you know, starting small and getting bigger. 
Um, so yeah, we, we really enjoyed this um, little statistics here. So shall we jump into these case studies? Yeah, I'm just <laughs> going to point that this kind of really shows the opportunities for yeah. XR out there. Uh, things as well, like 47% saying that this has enabled a widening of their Huge. current client base. Yeah. So 50% of these companies almost uh, expanding their clients, which even if they're not making immersive products, having them on the client list is going to be really amazing. significant for them. Yeah. Righty. Cool. Learning and development. Yes. Okay, so in terms of opportunities out there, we're going to look at some of the examples of companies that are creating good stuff out there. Uh, so normally when we do these as physical uh, workshops, we talk a bit about some examples and some use cases out there. And then afterwards we do a demo session. So you'll see some of the uh, case studies we're going to show later. We go into a bit more detail with them uh, as if we we're doing case studies. So our first example is from Make Real. Uh, they're a VR and AR company based down in Brighton. They focus specifically on learning, or I say they focus specifically on learning. Learning is one of the, uh, the key areas that they work in. That's workplace training, things like that. Uh, the example that I just showed on the GIF is a snapshot from uh, Lloyd's Personal Vitality and Resilience, or, or PVR as it's shortened to. And this is about soft skills training. This is about helping staff to uh, not only like be aware of, but also look after and support their, their fellow employees. And the, the purpose of it is to be able to identify when people are burning out, when they're working at peak performance, and be able to sort of like know how you have to almost engage with staff differently, depending on how, how where you see that they are. So it's very much about emotional intelligence rather than uh, more like a physical application. Cool, and, and I'll move on to this one. The next one's actually another example from, from uh, Make Real. And this is around more regulatory stuff. So health and safety, uh, physical applications of the technology. So uh, you'll see a quick GIF here, uh, climbing, a, climbing a wind turbine. So this is some work they did with Orsted, who are one of the largest uh, wind farm companies in the world. They're a massive global energy company, uh, but they focus specifically on green energy, which I think personally is going to be the future. And this is much more around those physical applications of the technology. So this is things like helping people gain the muscle memory to, to climb ladders and to make sure they're hooking in their harnesses and to be aware of risks that if they did the training out in the field, uh, they'd actually be at risk while they're becoming aware of them. Additionally, it saves costs because they don't have to take them all out on a boat for their, uh, their like basic training. They can do that all uh, virtually. Okay, so another area is probably the most obvious is, is in terms of marketing and PR. So there's a range of um, examples out there that kind of cover this section. Um, so uh, the quick example that we're going to show to you in this is something that was um, created by SkyVR. Um, SkyVR have actually experimented quite a lot in the immersive space. Um, and so this example is uh, called Britannia VR. Um, it's an immersive, immersive experience, but it's a, more like a fantasy drama, um, like, like we like to say, um, about the Romans that invaded um, Britain. Um, so we're going to play a little quick video to give you a bit more of insight into that yeah want to jump in uh, at this point i'm moving over to youtube uh we're going to play the video on mute so that we can talk yeah. over it but if the video doesn't pull across onto your screens please hammer 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 it into the chat <laughs> so that i see loads of alerts <laughs> and, and can fix it cool um there we go cool. so this just gives you a little quick trailer um to give you a quick example of the kind of stuff they've been doing um i think sky vr are quite a an interesting um, section of Sky at the moment and it's really interesting to see like their approach to immersive technology um, so yeah this is just a very very quick example yeah it's also quite interesting here if you look at the models of the people and how they look uh, Sky VR use a technique called photogrammetry and volumetric capture so it's uh, probably the most realistic we can get to creating uh, real life textures right now in terms okay. of representing real people and what they look like Cool. And then sort of the next stage really is obviously retail and consumer. This is kind of a, a big area that I think has been experimented with a lot over the last maybe three years. Um, a lot of the examples that we tend to use are kind of from 2016, 2017, um, but they work really, really well. Um, and I think with retail, there's a kind of um, 
almost like a clear set out plan of what they're trying to achieve. They are trying to get to their consumers in a way that is easy. Um, so I kind of feel that these examples um, work really, really well. Um, so the first one, you most likely would have heard of it or, or seen it is obviously IKEA. Um, and they, this IKEA is, again, like I said, is an older example, but it's such a great um, application in terms of easy use and it has a purpose. Um, so again, Bertie's going to play a little video for you. Um, not you. <laughs> not you. <laughs> again, the sound is off, but the showcasing of this is very, very straightforward. So it is, it's called Place. So you download the application onto your phone. You can place furniture in your home without having to worry about um, the sizing or, you know, oh, okay, yeah, that looks nice. Uh, that's not going to fit in our living room or get up the stairs. Um, but it's a really easy process and it worked really well. And I, from the kind of uh, con consumer reviews I've seen, people like it. People like it and it works. Um, there's a purpose and an end goal, which I really like. <laughs> yeah, so you're not these people. <laughs> yeah, and in terms of uh, the business applications of this, if you're, uh, if you're a big business and you're doing things like uh, manufacturing or industrial stuff, it's likely you have 3D models already of a lot of your products. Yeah. And uh, there's a big, it's, it's, it's a, I'd say it's like a concept or a big idea going around. It's like, one of, it's like another one of the big trends is, is this thing called digital twins. Yeah which is where you have a, a virtual 3D model or a virtual model of your physical products. And that's what Ikea has here. They have digital twins of all their furniture, which means that they can then plant that into the app, make sure it looks nice, and then people can plant that in their home and see it to scale. Mm -hmm. So it's almost repurposing assets that they probably use internally for design and prototyping. Exactly. Um, actually, if you stay in there, our next example is um, just a really quick one. It's from a company called, um, is it, it's 19 Crimes, isn't it? Yes. Um, so you want to talk about the, the wine uh, that these guys have developed? <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is another one where you open up the app and then you hover over the label and uh, the, the character on the label then comes to life and he tells you his story. So 19 crimes as a business or as a, as like a, as a concept, their whole thing is about they create wines based on uh, famous or notorious criminals. Uh, so they have 19, 19 crimes, that kind of thing. And this is another way for people to engage with that brand story. And it's another reason for people to want to buy it. And it's a nice little thing to have if you're doing like a, you know, like a little like dinner party or something. It's just another little like talking piece. Yeah. And it's not something that necessarily has just been, okay, this is a, like a, like a three month, six months uh, marketing campaign. This is something that they've now goes with each product, yeah. which I think is a nice way. And it shows that it's something that their audience really likes and works for them. Um, so I thought it was a really, really great example. Yeah. Definitely. Additionally, it's a, it's really made an impact for a lot of the drinks businesses out there in terms of knowing that they could repurpose their packaging. Like, you know, in the past, you might have seen Coke doing things like QR codes. And this is a new engaging way for uh, drinks companies to engage their customers. My grandparents, they own a, a little small brewery down in Kent and they saw this video on Facebook and they won't stop WhatsApping me, <laughs> asking me when I can create something like this. Today. That's great. <laughs> Perfect. So uh, moving forward, we have entertainment. Um, I think with, uh, with immersive and kind of like the language, we're still kind of trying to identify where things fit into. So kind of this area can kind of cover entertainment and documentary and uh, the arts kind of as well. Um, so again, this is something that, again, this is another example from Sky. Um, I can't get away with not doing a presentation without showing this man, um, <laughs> showing David Attenborough. Um, but again, this is another example from Sky um, and it's called Hold the World. And this is about obviously um, looking, kind of looking at education and um, looking at how we engage with this technology in a exciting way. And also it's just, it's David Attenborough. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, and so here you can see he's in the museum and he's looking at fossils, he's educating us on fossils, but it's incredibly interactive um, and it's a beautiful example of what um, combining technologies can do. So I, re I really, really love this example. Yeah. And there's a dinosaur, sorry. Exactly, who doesn't like dinosaurs? Yeah, no, it's a really good application of the technology. Uh, this was one of the, this was from 2018 now. Yeah. This is one of the first times that uh, people really saw uh, the photogrammetry technology yeah. being used. So if we just skip back slightly, you can see here, you can see David Talking having a nice chat with David. 
And this was using the, the photogrammetry and the volumetric capture technology. Do you remember too. which company? This was, uh, this was done by uh, Microsoft. It was, yeah. Yes, this was Microsoft with their volumetric capture studio, which they have over in Seattle. And so they flew, they flew David over, they did the capture in Seattle, and then they took all that files and they did the rest of the development here in the UK. Cool. All right, so um, we're going to try and go a little bit faster on this. So healthcare, healthcare, obviously, from the reports at the beginning, healthcare is massive. So, um, you know, looking at ways that they can innovate on the things that they already do, um, you know, looking at things that can save time, same costs. Um, so the example that we have here is um, from Microsoft and Philips Azurian program. Is that right? Yeah, Azurian. Azurian. Um, and this is with the HoloLens um, too. So you want to play this little video here. Um, again, you can go back and watch these videos and, you know, over and over again if you want to. Um, but then again, this is what I like about this is that, of course, obviously this is focused on um, healthcare, but this kind of technology is something that um, can transfer across to other industries. So this is, you know, this is a perfect example of being able to go, oh, I love what they're doing there. Can we apply this to um, something that we're doing in our warehouse or in an engineering kind of department? So I kind of really like this example. Um, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say as well, I think that a really smart application here, I don't think it was something they really thought about when they were developing it in terms of their scope, is that uh, you can't cross contaminate by touching a holographic display. So I think mm, that that's yes. been quite a nice little uh, benefit for them. Cool. Um, so we're going to go to a little bit more in depth in the next couple of uh, case studies. So as I said before, um, really start to think about your own business and um, all the project that you might be thinking about and what those challenges and solutions are and what you want to get out of it. What are the results you want to get out of it? Um, these next couple of examples we just thought were a great way of looking at their challenges and their solutions and how they've achieved those. So we're going to start with DHL. Yeah, cool. It's my turn. It is your turn, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, so uh, DHL, uh, obviously they're a massive global business. Uh, everyone knows DHL. Uh, they do things from deliveries and logistics all the way through to managing whole supply chains for, for customers out there. So uh, big manufacturers uh, such as uh, Rico in this example here. Uh, so they're always trying to find new ways to drive efficiencies and to uh, make things as uh, well, yeah, as profitable as possible, really. So here they're using augmented reality technology. So this was using the uh, the Vuzix eyewear. I'm just going to move away from that gear yep. again. <laughs> Uh, this was using the Vuzix eyewear and it, this was done with a company called Ubimax. And this is actually back from 2015. So this was really early days. And the idea here was that people would wear the headsets or they'd wear the little eyewear and then they'd be able to look at their manifest uh, virtually or digitally. And then it would guide them to the right area in the warehouse that they need to go to. And then once they get to the right area, it would then scan the barcodes to ensure they've picked up the right product. What this does is it made people faster because they weren't looking for which aisles they need to go to. And it also meant that there was less uh, human error because the scanner was almost like a, a double verification to ensure that the employee had picked the right product. And finally, it was a, it was a massive uh, saver on things like paper because the, the manifest is digital. Whereas in the past, uh, every day or every couple of hours, uh, the employee would get a, a paper manifest on a folder that they'd then have to you know, go through and tick off and cross off. Uh, in staying with DHL, uh, we also have some virtual reality training they did, and this was around packing. So where, you know, they need to make sure things are as cost efficient as possible and as fuel efficient as possible, they need to pack as tightly as they can and as efficiently as they can. Uh, so this training done by Immerse, who are another uh, UK based learning company. This was about, yeah, doing that dense packing training mm. and helping staff to make sure that they're doing this in the correct way. And this was part of DHL's uh, three year long program of implementing technology and implementing virtual reality technology into their training centers. So while I'm talking about Immerse, I'm gonna use that to segue into another piece of work that Immerse have done. Uh, this is with General Electric. Uh, General Electric, another massive conglomerate, uh, and obviously they do other things, not just electric anymore. They also work in the healthcare space, uh, developing uh, large, uh, large pieces of uh, medical technology and also helping and training staff who then work in hospitals over in America. 
So uh, this was radiography training. So this is using uh, radiograph machines and uh, heart imaging setups. And in this, you have to put sensors on people, disinfect them, and run through the whole process uh, in virtual reality. And the uh, General Electric, they said that this training really added value to them because they're able to get staff going through heart imaging tests and heart imaging setups and get everything re ready to go. But they could do this virtually, so they wouldn't have to take away rooms, mm. which might be vital to you know a patient's survival. So they're able to do this training without holding up rooms. Perfect. Okay, moving swiftly on, we've got another Brighton-based company that we're a really big fan of. So Curoscope, who are based down in Brighton. Um, we, uh, they had a t-shirt that came out um, a couple of years ago, but this is one of their newest things. So it's called Curoscope Multiverse. Um, as you can see, let's jump onto that. Beautiful GIF. Um, so it is a poster which comes to life using augmented reality. Um, this is like a perfect time right now, um, especially for children that are at home. Uh, it's something that the parents can use. It's something that the teachers can use. Um, and I just think it's, re it's a really great example in terms of education. Um, in terms of their, um, what Curiscope said about it was basically it's, it's addressing that kind of classroom home uh, learning, you know, saying it's busy and they wanted something simple and easy to be able to push out at the moment. Um, also, the uh, da, 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 da. yeah, so it's, it's they're being able to create higher perceived values in AR experiences. Um, you know, it's not just a poster; they put a lot of work into this. Um, and like I said before, this is the perfect time to be using something like this. Um, it's easy access, and they're still—I think they're still shipping these out currently, yeah. um, which works really nicely. Um, and then going next. Um, we're of time. Um, so the next piece, oh no, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, we're going to jump um, back to another, to back to Orsted actually. So this is a, a different um, experience that was made by Orsted. This is a 360 video. Um, so this is looking at our approach to the climate. Um, you know, uh, the, you know, the purpose was to basically raise awareness of uh, the climate crisis. Um, and it's a really nice 360 video. It's available on YouTube, which um, thinking about distribution, this is another way of getting your content out there. What a lovely, beautiful gift. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so we're, it's raising awareness and uh, you go up and it's all from the perspective of being an astronaut. So looking down to the earth um, and thinking about, you know, it's actually you're a part of such something so big but once you're up in space it's you know it seems really really tiny and we need to protect it um currently um the views on youtube for this uh, 360 video are over three million which is amazing um looking at sort of the scale and how it's getting out there which is really really great yeah and in terms of this project it this was uh, a marketing and pr piece for orsted so they gauge their return on investment on those youtube views and the impact created by it yeah okay so we've talked about a lot of case studies <laughs> in a very short amount of time. Um, but again, so we, you know, getting started with the XR, when we, when we do um, workshops, um, we tend to do exercises and things. So we won't be able to do that today, but we're going to give you a little bit of a sort of a, a preview um, of what we would want to go through with you in terms of um, figuring out what you want from the immersive industry. Um, so again, I'm encouraging you to, um, you know, think, about what you want out of this also if you get an opportunity in the future you must 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 try this tech um you know if you're if, if you're not appealing to it or you feel like you need to be in an immersive box it's like it's the wrong angle i think um and that's what you'll find from a lot of businesses as well that that's kind of their approach so yes yeah, so this is an exercise that we do in our workshops i go through yeah, so uh, normally if this was in a workshop, you'd, you'd have tried some stuff, you'd have learned a bit about case studies, and hopefully it would have sparked your imagination to think about how you can use this inside your own business. And then we'd start looking at ways that you could then implement it. <clears throat> so this is based on a, a fairly common uh, model that people use in software development around uh, identifying where your technology is going to be useful. Uh, so, for example, making sure that you are finding the right use case, you're not just using the technology for the sake of using technology. Uh, so making sure you can, you can see exactly what uh, the software is going to solve. Then you need to start creating a test experience. So like the example I showed earlier or from MakeReal with the uh, wind turbine uh, training with Allstead. Uh, before uh, MakeReal were doing working at height training, the first thing they did is they created a test experience using a ladder and they had clients walking up this ladder or climbing up this ladder in virtual reality and uh, clients felt felt in danger they felt like they were actually up a ladder 
And that showed that this technology really had the ability to be impactful and be effective in that space. And then you can use this feedback in order to actually drive your design going forwards. And then finally, uh, it's about understanding exactly how you measure success and making sure you're tracking things effectively and iterating where you need to. So one of the big uh, areas where projects sometimes fail is that they don't actually measure the, the, the success or the return on investment for, for the actual business case. Sometimes you'll see projects that cost half a million quid to make and they only received 10 views but the, the project got a whole bunch of press, it got covered, it got lots of awards. And if the goal of the project was to raise the profile of the business, then that would be measured as, as a success, even though to some people out there, it'd be deemed as a failure. And on the other side of things, uh, the project might have been signed off to meet a certain objective, and it might, have, it might have got loads of press, it might have been watched by loads of people, but it might not meet that objective. So whilst the project is wildly popular, it's still, it's still a failure to the business because there's going to be one person who signed off a use case who's going to be very upset with where their budget was spent. Cool. Perfect. That's job ahead. Cool. We're so, about to finish. so we're going to move on. We're just going to show you some quick resources and we're going to talk about these. So when you're trying to identify your use case, uh, our recommendation would be to go to Make Reels website and find their use case identification framework. This is a really good tool. Oh, I like just turned off. This is a really good tool for uh, helping you identify your use case, sort of looking at your pain points and your challenges and then finding the right thing to use. Uh, we'll have links to this in the presentation. In terms of finding production companies to work with, I mean, you can come talk to us. Uh, we can pinpoint you in the right direction, but objectively you could talk to AIXR, which are the Academy uh, for International Extended Reality, or you could talk to Immerse UK, who, as I mentioned earlier, are a massive membership organization. Alternatively, if you're feeling a little bit more confident about this, uh, you might have done software development before, you might be doing content production yourself, you might find it easier to work with freelancers uh, in terms of uh, more streamlined work, it might be to save budget. And for this, I'd recommend Blend Market, which is created by a company called Blend Media. And here you can create your brief, uh, you can put it up, you can put your budget up, and then small freelance teams, so you know, maybe like an individual freelancer or maybe like a small creative team or two or three people can come and they can respond to your brief and they can put out a pitch and they can put their own budgets on it and things like that. Cool. Um, as we're kind of running out of time, we're just going to end on this little point here. So thinking about what's next. Um, so we kind of have to talk about the current world um, as it is. Um, so um, just before the pandemic, um, our kind of big focus for the future in terms of the immersive was 5G. So, um, you know, waiting for the launch of 5G, um, it opens up a whole world of possibilities for the immersive technology industry. And there was a lot of um, funding opportunities out there, which was to help demonstrate the user cases. So it's something that we're really excited about and something that I hope we can sort of you know the industry as a whole can continue looking at which we're you know really, really excited about. Um, we also obviously have to mention COVID-19 and how the immersive industry has been um, affected by this. Um, from our perspective um, it means obviously uh, events, um, client meetings face-to-face, -face, those physical demonstrations uh, are not happening right now um, which is completely understandable. Um, but um, in terms of adapting to this global pandemic, um, there's been a kind of uprise in terms of people that are already using VR, having client meetings in, in VR, using social VR spaces, um, experimenting, which I think is still really important in terms of the space. We still need to experiment. Um, and, you know, because people that are outside of the space might not necessarily be having a headset at home and picking up and jumping into a meeting. Um, so, and there's still things that I think that are missing from social spaces, um, but that's fine because that's in terms of experimentation, that's where we're at. Um, what a lot of people have been doing, which I've noticed as well, is that they're looking at VR for like fitness, you know, meditation, you know, escaping from what's happening right now, um, which I think again is, is really important. And um, I know there's been a lot of news articles out there about, you know, oh, this is the time for VR. I, th I think you've been reading the same. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, we're just looking at you know, what do people need? Are people jumping into social spaces because they're, you know, they're after that social interaction, they want to be able to talk to people face to face, or is it a fantastic way to show a client what you've been working on? Um, so these are the kind of things that are kind of going around in our head at the moment about, about COVID-19. Um, and yeah, and I'm going to, I'm going to leave it on that, 
on that point there, which we can chat more about in the one-to-ones or the, um, in the chat there. Oh yeah. yeah. And that's just a last example, but we'll skip through these and then we'll end here. Yeah. Uh, just a quick example about how Ford are using it. Uh, they're doing it for remote, uh, remote working. Uh, just a quick example of AR in the future, working with physical devices. Uh, you can look at this properly on the full presentation. Yeah. yeah. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed that conversation. Okay. Thank you very much for that, uh, Bertie and Sammy. Um, I'll just give it uh, a couple of minutes for any questions to be typed up into the, the Q&A box. But um, I think one of the things you touched on quite early on, um, those kind of two aspects, I think one was you, you were very kind of careful about the language you use because again I think sometimes the language is perceived to be a barrier to entry for uh, use of this technology um, but also kind of the sliding scale opportunities like you say that when when some businesses hear about augmented reality or virtual reality um, they don't necessarily see the the opportunities within that so there's only ever going to be maybe sort of smaller iterations of how they may perceive it to be used um, but you've spoken about some of the examples before. Could you talk about some of the businesses you've worked with and how you've how you've helped them to integrate those types of technologies, maybe from personal case studies, you're able to do that at all? Yeah, of course. Got those. <laughs> yeah, uh, and as this question is asked to me, my mind is going completely <laughs> blank. Uh, Orsted's probably a great example. Yeah, Orsted, that's a great point, actually. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Orsted, uh, they they used uh, virtual reality for uh, this 360 video, or they used 360 video for it actually. And the the idea behind this was how can we create an emotional response? Uh, so this the video, the 360, the space safari, it was launched at the climate summit in New York in September last year. Uh, the initial role of this was how can we, or the initial brief was how can we really impact the people who are going to be attending the climate summit to make them think and to make them sort of have this this overview effect the the idea that our little blue dot in the solar system is tiny and it's fragile and it needs to be protected and then from there it kind of grew into well if we speak to astronauts we can get an astronaut to voice to do the voiceover and actually give their testimonial and a lot of astronauts uh, are really really outspoken on on climate change uh, and say that it's the biggest threat to, to our planet, not just humanity. Uh, so this kind of started to, to build up and then from there it turned into the, the brief of, well, if we use 360 video, it's immersive, it's a good way we can put people in headsets. In terms of distribution as well. Yeah. It was most the most straightforward way in terms of putting it on YouTube for that, for that time. It's just easier for them to pop it online and for people to access it yeah. quite quickly. Yeah, exactly. So it was a it was a good way to hit uh, a number of sort of uh, success points on, on the project. It's worth noting as well that whenever we work on this stuff, we always work really closely with, with production partners out there. So we don't actually create mm. any VR or AR stuff ourselves commercially, except for our own little like, you know, test cases and doing things for fun or creating films. So we work really closely with production companies and with the clients themselves. So, and I think also one of the kind of the, the early slides about the, the potential growth of the industry um, over the next five years, I, I remember correctly, I think it's almost about a thousand percent growth uh, over the next five years up to 2025, which not only demonstrates how, how quickly businesses may look to adopt this type of technology, but how sought after it's going to be as well. And therefore kind of the, the novel approaches to the way that it's applied. Um, and like you say, as much as you've got the, the, the user cases you've also got that marketing and PR aspect which people can really benefit from um, and we, we've seen sort of different uh, campaigns over over the last few years and you also always see see sort of new opportunities coming out of things like CES in America so is there anything over the last maybe six or 12 months that's really caught your eye? Uh, so the first thing I'd just say is regarding the the, the, the PwC growth reports and stuff is uh, all the way from 2015 up until now, we've seen reports coming out saying the growth of immersive technology is going to be astronomical. And uh, as we can see from 2015 until now, it's, it's, it's grown, but it hasn't been this astronomical, life-changing, world-changing event that perhaps these reports said it would be. So it's always worth taking them with a grain of salt and uh, 
I, I hate to I hate to be the pessimist, but sometimes it's worth taking a pessimistic approach and thinking that yeah, they're forecasting it's going to grow by a thousand percent. So let's personally forecast that it's probably going to grow, but maybe not by a thousand percent. In terms of uh, really interesting and amazing technology that's been coming out that's really caught my eye, uh, there's a company called Dent Reality. They're a really small startup. Uh, they're based in East London. Uh, they're actually looking for investment, so it's probably worth <laughs> speaking to uh, the startup centre. Uh, they are creating augmented reality for, for navigation inside of retail spaces. So you'd be able to have, with your phone, you'd be able to have a, a map pop up on your phone uh, using some really, really smart mapping technology from Apple. So say you're in a, a shopping centre and you wanted to know where New Look was, uh, your phone would then be able to tell you exactly where New Look is and then... It, it, you'd be able to pull your screen up or pull your phone up and then you'd have uh, arrows pointing you and showing you exactly the way to get there. And then even more advanced is things like what they're also working on is, say you go to, you go to a massive Tesco, you've never been there before, but you, want, you just want to buy bacon and eggs. <laughs> you put that in, you put that in and then it will be able to direct you exactly to where you need to go. And then uh, the return investment there for people like Tesco in terms of giving the data away to, for the mapping of the store is things like they can see exactly what customers are after. Uh, it gives them another data input. Uh, and then additionally, if they really want to, they can guide you to the bacon and eggs, but they might guide you via butter, brown sauce, brown sauce <laughs> buns, <laughs> things like that. Plus all, all of the, uh, the added extras that you're going to want. So, um, <laughs> We've had uh, one of the questions coming through the, uh, the Q&A box, which I, I think also links kind of a little bit to how you've just um, explained the potential uses. But um, how do you think COVID and social distancing for the rest of the year will impact uh, using VR at events in public venues? Um, and I think this is quite, again, this is uh, very much in the, the mind of consumer behaviours. Uh, will people want to put headsets on with lingering fears of the virus? I think that's uh, quite an appropriate question at this time. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll add a bit at the start and then I'll see if you want to add anything. Okay, uh, my first thought would just be that I don't know if we are going to have any more events this year, this yeah. year, uh, in terms of people using VR. Uh, I think we might, we'll see people being a bit more keen and a bit more interested in adopting the, the, the VR hygiene etiquette that they have, mm. uh, in Asia. So things like the, uh, the one use, uh, face mask. That goes on here to uh, sort of give you a, a barrier between the headset itself and your face uh, and then things just like making sure that hygiene is kept up yeah I, I i do i do believe that i think yeah you're right in terms of like i don't i don't see us being at events for the rest of the year just out of pure safety and i think that's really really important and i think um yes it can be obviously very it's you know being in any industry right now everyone's a bit freaked out um but i think it's important that our you know even when those events start up health and safety has always been our number one concern um you know that's just going to be a higher priority um but in terms of like what the immersive space is going to kind of do about that is is that experimentation phase um i think we we always talked about it in the beginning sort of 2013 to 2015 was like oh this is our experimentation phase this is where we you know figure out how to do things that's really play around and i think now seeing that more companies are looking at those social vr spaces and you know, does this work for us is it right um i think that this is the time now to be really exploring it um and it doesn't work for everybody that just just as putting that out there it's not for everybody like i'm not the biggest fan of um, going into those spaces because i don't really like the the style of avatars or like the way they approached me that's but that's just my um preference um but for other people they really enjoy it and it is that kind of social thing they're experiment that, like they really want right now so i think more experimentation ne is needed and i think maybe that will prompt maybe a few more companies to pop out uh, yeah. pop out of this yeah i think i think just another thought as well in terms of like almost like how we deliver vr experiences yeah. and vr demos now uh there's a, a fairly new agency called solar flare i think they're called yeah, solar, solar flare and they recently did a vr launch for uh, a shoe brand it mm. might have been adidas or asics and because of the lockdown they couldn't they couldn't just do a demo they couldn't do a press day so what they had to do is they had to buy a bunch of oculus quests 
make sure their app was pre-installed and super accessible so that anyone who hadn't done VR before could pick it up quite quickly. And then they shipped it, they shipped the headset to each journalist's house individually. So, you know, if you've got key clients or you've got key prospective clients, it's, it might be that you have to invest that little bit more into pre-sales. It might be that you make sure your app is super accessible and then you ship it to them so they can try it with a return label on it and ask very nicely that they send it back <laughs> once they're done with it. So um, I'm just going to um, keep the Q&A function open just for a, a couple more minutes, see if we, we get anything else in. But I th again, I think kind of some, something that might just be worth touching on was that you mentioned, um, obviously, that you, you kind of help with the marketing and PR side of things and you work with a production company. Um, I think maybe the perception is when you when you look to maybe explore this this as an option that the sort of typically companies maybe operating in this area are able to provide all of those functions at, at once. Um, whereas it's become sort of quite apparent from the way you explained it that you, you have a production company that you work with. So can you maybe explain a bit of the process for how, I know you sort of spoke about designing a, a test case and everything, but again, how, how people should explore um, the opportunities for kind of uh, XR sort of immersive tech opportunities in their business again. So how they would engage with someone and, and how they really develop that process through to maybe kind of understanding the marketing alongside it. Yeah. So in terms of uh, the opportunity of developing uh, an immersive, an immersive application or an immersive use case, uh, there's, there's a couple of places to start. Uh, the first place that's always worth starting is, making is, is being aware that you as someone who might be commissioning something, it's your responsibility to get educated mm -hmm. on what the hardware is and what the applications are and exactly what the limitations of the hardware are. Because whilst you could talk to a production company, um, it's, it's still kind of on you to make sure that what they're selling you is exactly what you need and is the right thing for you. Uh, in terms of like where we kind of work with that and come into that, we've guided companies along the way. Yeah. It kind of comes at different angles. So you might have, we might have somebody that approaches us and goes, oh, we're right at the beginning. We've heard VR is a thing. What do we do? And we can, we kind of, we can step in at that point and go, okay, <laughs> have you tried it? Uh, no. Okay. Why not? What is it that you are wanting to gain out of this experience? Um, have you been told to tick an immersive box in your meeting? yes or no um, and then exploring you know i mean and for us as well we have to have an understanding of that business as well to kind of try and guide them um so yeah we'll look at the kind of the very very beginning stages and sometimes that means we're there the whole way through so we might advise them on a particular production company that we think that would work really well with them keeping it open and clear and then in terms of the marketing afterwards we come in with the campaign and we might be the ones that are demo demoing that content for them because we have the vr background um you know we do big setups we do big festivals and events or we did um, <laughs> um you know and that kind of thing and we also talk to people about distribution because again that's another big thing that is often kind of missed off your kind of um uh, probably a plan of action is the distribution side of it um, so we, we can kind of cover most things and a lot of time we come in right at the end so somebody might have already made something and then gone oh we don't know how to market this <laughs> so that's where we step in so we we're quite agile I think in terms of how we approach things um, but I mean we as a background we have a, a very big passion for the technology and we believe that it has to be used for a purpose so I think that's why we can kind of give a bit more value and we know how the tech works so we can help on that side as well. Yeah. So, and uh, we've had a, a question come in from James. Um, James. Where do you feel there is more value, uh, consumer focused VR or enterprise scale VR? Uh, I think it really depends on what you're trying to create. I think in terms of actual value itself, in terms of where can you make more money, it's going to be in enterprise. But I mean, it, again, it's like if you create something really good, you can probably make more money from like one thing in the consumer space, like Beat Saber, for example. If you made a killer fitness app for VR and you can sell a million copies of that at uh, $30 each, after the cut from uh, the, the retail stores or the, the, the digital stores, you're still looking at like $25 million. 
So if you've got something that's going to be long term and you know that the audience or the consumer is going to be coming back and back again to it, then you know you've got a user case that will actually be of a purpose, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Like if you're making something for, oh, we're just going to make something quick for a, a PR thing, that's not necessarily going to, it might not necessarily give you, there's some really bad examples out there. <laughs> so that might not necessarily give you the right kind of thing you're looking for. But again, it's, it is kind of always going back to those challenge solutions. Yeah, what I is think, your results, really? I think enterprise is probably, if you're building more of a sustainable business model, yeah. you're going to look at enterprise. And in fact, we're seeing some of the really big businesses trying to pivot more into enterprise. Uh, Facebook bought Oculus, and the idea was it was going to be a consumer platform. They were going to create the new, the new world of, of social media, and it was going to be in VR. And that hasn't quite played off for them, so they're kind of doing a lot more work now in the enterprise space after they've realized the applications in, yeah, a lot of like the business applications that are out there. And then additionally, magically, uh, this week have uh, laid off a really significant percentage of their staff who are focused on consumer. And uh, they've realized that the Magic Leap headset is actually probably better off for, for an enterprise use. So I think that's probably the place for, yeah, longer term businesses. Um, okay, and uh, I'm just conscious of time, so what I'm going to do is we have one more question come in, so we'll, we'll finish after this one, but I just want to add before, uh, before I pose the question is that if, um, if there's anything that hasn't been covered uh, and you'd like to book a one-to-one, -one, then please email uez at essex.ac.uk. Uh, and for those of you that have already booked a one to one, you should hopefully have had some timings come through. But if you're not sure, again, if you email us on, on that address, um, Egler or John will respond and they'll confirm the time and they'll also confirm the Zoom room details with you. So uh, just to finish on one final question from Stephanie. Um, what would you recommend for a freelance project manager in XR? to find contracts with larger companies. Uh, she sort of says she often is blocked as they prefer permanent contracts for security purposes. Is that something you feel you can uh, expand on? Do you want me to start? Yeah, go for it. Uh, yeah, in terms of being a, a freelance project manager working in this space, I think that there, there are a lot of people who are looking for, for contract staff it tend it might it might tend to be like the smaller you know like the smaller companies that are working on their own sort of most it depends i think a lot of the uk based companies are actually made up of freelancers so we work on a freelance like basis we upscale our business and downscale our business into de determining on kind of projects but we've seen a lot of other companies do the same in this space yeah and i think a lot of the companies a lot of the production companies are growing and it's whilst it's sustainable growth it's that case of we're taking in more projects we need to hire a production manager let's bring on someone freelance uh until this job either grows into something bigger or or it goes away once the job's done so i think the, the opportunities are out there it may be perhaps that you haven't targeted the right companies or you need to slightly adjust your focus there's a lot of people looking for project managers in the arts space, mm -hmm. both from the client side in terms of people who are producing the work uh, and then from production companies who are working in that space as well, uh, where arts is a lot more up and down in terms of business. Uh, the arts is a much bigger uh, freelance, freelance industry. Would blend market space be good for that? Yeah, I think blend market might be a good place to look in terms of signing yourself up and getting your portfolio and stuff on there because that's just worth looking for or having a look at every now and again, because there's new jobs and new briefs going on there all the time. And the idea of that is that hiring in freelance teams or small teams. So there are sometimes jobs out there, people looking for creative producers. Maybe signing up to Immerse UK as well, potentially. Uh, I, know, I don't know how many job posts they put on there, but it's just worth, it's another connection. It's another network to tap into. Yeah. And uh, email us your CV yeah, as well, because well. if we see anything, we yeah, we're happy to recommend help. you. So, okay, and I think also just to, to kind of draw on that as well, you have to have to recognise under the current circumstances that there's going to be different approaches that businesses will take during this time. Um, unfortunately, obviously, in, in extreme cases, uh, some companies may sort of close down particular aspects of their business and look to outsource yeah. during this time because for a, a temporary period, it will be more cost effective. Um, and you've also got businesses that will be looking to actually innovate and capitalize during this time and therefore expansion and diversification is also an opportunity. 
Um, so, you know, try, try and sort of keep it on a, a positive note, which is very much the case that there will always be opportunities out there. Yeah. Uh, and there'll be looking, businesses looking to, to use this period um, to their advantage. Um, and I think it's the case that, again, as, uh, as Bertin Savage sort of uh, mentioned there, it's about making sure that you are as accessible in as many market opportunities as you can be. Um, and uh, again, without knowing and uh, being unable to comment, you know, looking at LinkedIn um, and sort of just connecting to the right groups and the right communities on, on LinkedIn and Facebook. Um, and I, you mentioned one earlier, uh, a friend of mine runs Virtually Healthy, which is a VR uh, Facebook group. So again, it's worth kind of looking in places like that. Um, but really, so it's, uh, it's about keeping your, your options open. And as I sort of said, there's a lot of talk about businesses that are going to use this as an opportunity. There's been government funding uh, made available uh, through Innovate UK for businesses that may have opportunities out of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic at the moment. And some of those could well be in the areas of extended reality as well. So it's worth keeping an eye out on places on, on the Innovate UK website to see which projects have been funded as well and actually start to see what's happening in the marketplace. So on that note, I'd like to close by saying once again, thank you very much for, uh, for your time this morning.